So, welcome to Astrology Night at Soul Food Coffee House in Redmond, Washington. And we do this the last Wednesday night of every month. And thank you, Makia and Baristas and Soul Food for hosting this. Um, if any of you out there in internet land want to come to a last Wednesday night of the month, just call ahead to make sure I'm in the country because occasionally um, we send something in, but not often, but, but occasionally. Um, this month we had over, well over 60,000 separate views on, online. So uh, Soul Food is getting some notoriety out of this, hopefully. Here we are uh, looking ahead to June of 2018. Um, I have just returned from uh, seven days at the largest astrology gathering in the Western world. There were 1,500 astrologers from all around the world, 150 plus lecturers. Um, four classes a day uh, where you had a choice of going to any one of 18 simultaneously running lectures and it was fantastic it's networking community it's hanging out for many of us with our tribe people that I've known for 20 30 30 some 35 years and it was a pretty amazing thing all the lectures from that conference will be available within a couple of weeks um, a UAC that's UAC the United Astrology Conference and uh, if you Google or just go to uacastrology.com you can find the information there I have two events I want to talk about real quickly. There's not much um, coming up, at least in major events for me right now. Um, but I will be doing my, I don't know how many, th annual uh, summer retreat at Brighton Bush Hot Springs. There are some cards. I'll put them down on these tables after I'm done. Brighton Bush Hot Springs, as you may know, is in the central um, old growth forest of Oregon, about two hours outside of Portland one hour from Salem and it is a magical magical place and I will be doing a four-day workshop there um, that will be about bringing the planets down into our lives we will use the charts of all the participants as part of the curriculum um, there is absolutely fantastic all-you-can-eat vegetarian food there's wonderful magical hot tubs walks to take everywhere and we meet in this amazing place down by the river that they call the river yurt and um that will be limited to about 30 people. And if you're interested, I suggest you get a hold of them and uh, and let them know soon because that will sell out and it's already pushing up close, but there's still room. So that's Brighton Bush Hot Springs, July 29th through August 2nd, four nights. Uh, is that four nights or three nights? Four nights. And, uh, and we're gonna have fun whether you're there or not. The second thing I want to mention real quickly is Bali, <laughs> and this will be my seventh uh, retreat that I'm leading in Bali. It's an eight-day retreat. We'll have one day off in the middle for, for full-day excursions for those people who want to either spend the day at the beach or hiking up a volcano or going to doing whatever um, or just sleeping and resting and absorbing the, the sun and the jungle. Uh, this retreat um, is called Think Globally, Act Locally. And again, the backbone of the curriculum that we use are the charts of the the participants it's quite transformative because it's not just about what's out there it's about what's in here during this workshop we will employ a lot of experiential techniques um, of which there are many fascinating techniques including uh, astro drama imagine yourself standing in the middle of a 30-foot wheel with different
different people playing planets in your chart and actually acting out your shit and you don't have any control over what they say. And it will be me facilitating your interaction with them. It's quite powerful. That's one of the many techniques that we'll be do using, but it's a lot of fun and it's a totally magical place. It's at a retreat center that's about a 20 minute, half hour car ride to Ubud, which is the cultural capital of Bali. Um, this is a retreat center built by a dear friend of mine expressly for the purpose of astrological retreats. The place where we'll actually be doing our work is in a large meditation hall that's open to the jungle on four sides. This is definitely out in the boonies, in the rice fields, in the jungle. It's totally magical. Um, Italy used to be my go-to place. The first time I went to Bali about a dozen years ago, um, Bali replaced Italy. So that's how cool Bali is. Um, that's enough. So, here we are on the cusp, uh, the edge of June. Uh, for the record, we are recording this on May 30th, and uh, we will be looking at the month of June ahead. Um, there are some interesting things to report for the month of June, and I think the most interesting thing to report is this. Well, no, it's that, because before we talk about this, I want to tell you about something that will lead us into that. Did you ever notice that when you have like a really crazy hectic week and you're overworking and you don't have time to do stuff and, and, and there's all kinds of pressure and tension and things are going on at job, at home, in relationships with your kids, with your parents, whatever, and you can't wait till the weekend and finally the weekend arrives and you have absolutely nothing scheduled over the weekend and you're so excited and it gets to Saturday and you wake up and you feel like shit? and you get sick, yeah. or a headache, or a cold, or, you know what I'm saying, you know what this phenomenon that I'm talking about? It, it happens often. It's almost like sometimes we don't have time to process what's going on, and we wait for an opening in the universe, and then we deal with what we didn't deal with the previous Tuesday, or the previous decade. We'll get there in a minute. Well, as I look ahead to June, this is how I see June. It's not like there's nothing going on in June because there's, this is gonna be a, a, a careful use of the double negative. There's never nothing going on. <laughs> but sometimes the goings on, going ons, goings on, are so profound and so, so big that whatever else is happening in our world, we focus on what's going on because it's overwhelming. You know, um, I mean, there are events that stand out. Um, uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the Kennedy assassin assassination, um, the, um, uh, the um, uh, bombing of the World Trade Tower, the election of Trump. Um, you know, there are events that, that, that are big events that, that take over whatever's going on in our personal life. June doesn't have any of those. Now, does that mean nothing astounding will happen in June? No, on some level it means we may get sick. And I don't mean we personally, individually. It may be that all the stuff that's been building has time to catch up with itself and express. And, and, and this is kind of my first inclination as I look at June. One of the things that I look at when I'm looking at the month ahead or the year ahead, um, or even the decade ahead, is what are the slower moving planets doing? Because the slower moving planets are the ones that create the deeper hum the longer lasting events. I mean, we have a new moon and a full moon every month. Every single, you know, 28, 29 days, there's another new moon and full moon. And some of them have greater intensity or power or ease of expression or whatever, but there's nothing extraordinary about a new moon. Occasionally, two times a year, a new moon will be eclipsed. 
that will eclipse the sun. And that makes it more extraordinary, but even those happen a couple of times a year. But when you look at some of the outer planet transits, they happen very rarely. Some of them only happen once every couple hundred years. When you talk about the lineup of Neptune taking um, 165 years to go around the sun once, and Pluto taking 245 years to go around the sun once, from Earth's point of view, they line up once every 500 years. And when they do, it's profound and powerful, not only for the individuals living in that time, but for the planet itself. For example, the Uranus-Pluto conjunction, which happens every other century. Well, it happens about every, it depends on the speed of Pluto. This time it happened about a, it was a century apart. The last time that happened was 1850. In 1965, they aligned, and that alignment set the tone for the 1960s. This is a powerful event. There are other powerful events, the, 20, the, the 2012 to 2015, when Uranus and Pluto were 90 degrees to each other. A lot of the 60s issues, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll in particular, um, gender issues, ecology, power struggle, um, revolution on the streets, um, the use of drugs uh, for real. All these things came back into being, not that they ever really went away, but, but this was a major event. There are none in June. That's where, that's what this whole, uh, I'm, I'm trying to contrast. Um, there are some things that happen, but when I run the transits for the month ahead, I look at the transits from the, sun, the faster moving planet to the slower moving planet. And the moon is the fastest moving, then the sun, then Mercury. If Mercury turns retrograde, that's an event, it doesn't. Um, Venus, Mars, we have a Mars retrograde at the end of the month, and we'll talk a bit about that. That is an important thing, and it, and, and it is, I don't want to say extraordinary, but it occurs only every other year, and where it occurs in the sky is important. We'll get to that. Um, but there aren't any transits from Jupiter even to the outer planets, even though there's one from last month that we talked about that's lingering. I'll mention that in a moment. But there's no planet, there's no transits from Saturn to the other outer planets or Uranus or Neptune to Pluto. And so it's almost like this month is filled with noise, <laughs> static. There's stuff going on, but it may not stand out in the long run. But then again, it may turn out to be a Saturday where something happens that we didn't plan on that's a buildup from what happened before. You with me? All right. So let's start off and um, look at the chart for June 1st, which is actually, after I've done this whole thing about this, nothing extraordinary. This is an extraordinary chart, but, but it's extraordinary not because of what expresses. It's extraordinary because of the ease at which it expresses. In astrology, historically, we have good aspects and bad aspects. Now, this has been somewhat done away with by modern astrology that says what used to be called a bad aspect isn't necessarily bad, and what used to be called a good aspect isn't always good. Here's how it works. In traditional astrology, the negative, hard, or, um, or difficult aspects, um, it used to be called afflicted planets. If two planets were 90 degrees, they were afflicted because they didn't express easily. However, I can hear my personal trainer telling me, no pain, no gain. So two planets that are square. Uh, let's use an example. Um, uh, actually, let's use an example that we'll have coming up this month. Um, let's use a, um, a, a square of um, Venus to Uranus. Um, um, we, we have on, on this chart, we, this is just for the first of the month, we have Venus in Cancer that by the end of the month will move into Leo. And as it does, it will square Uranus. Uranus, while we're here, let's actually give you the actual date. 
um, Venus will square Uranus on June 14th. We'll get there chronologically in a minute, but I want you to get something, kind of understand something first. So a square means the energies don't get along with each other. There's conflict, there's, there's interaction, but squares are the source of creativity. Again, no pain, no gain. If there's no, if there's no conflict, there's no dialogue. There's no, there's no attention put to things. And so the hard aspects, the conjunctions, the squares, 90 degrees, the opposition, 180 degrees, and for that matter, even the half squares, 45 degrees, or the squares and a half, 135 degrees. All these aspects are traditionally afflicted but in modern psychological astrology, we look at these aspects as the juice of creativity because without some sort of hard aspect, we're just couch potatoes, which sounds fine, but it may be difficult to make something happen in your life. I'll come back to that in just a minute with an example. The flip side is that trines are traditionally good. The energy flows. Uh, it's a 90 degree angle. We have here a chart, by the way, and this is why I'm talking about this. We have on June 1st, we have Jupiter in mid Scorpio trining Neptune in mid Pisces being trined by Venus in mid Cancer. Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces are all water signs. They're of the same element. This is an equilateral triangle. Buckminster Fuller called the equilateral triangle the most stable form, the most stable geometry in nature. It's stable. It's easy. It ain't going anywhere. Um, one of the things that I've done in some of, some of my experiential workshops is we take um, uh, 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 pieces of um, uh, two by four, or you can think of this just even with straws or toothpicks. If you have two, th three toothpicks glued together into an equilateral triangle, you can't move it, it's stable. But if you have four toothpicks glued into a square, it's sloppy, it's floppy. Squares require attention. <laughs> Trines do not. Now, in, in traditional astrology, trines are good aspects. They're planets that are easy. They're expressive. On the day of the World Trade Tower bombing, on September 11th, 2001, transiting Mercury was trine to transiting Saturn. This is a good aspect. Mercury is the messenger. Saturn is karmic and, and real. So Mercury trining Saturn in someone's chart, we might say this is a really good aspect because your communication, Mercury, allows you to express things that are real. Good for who? That aspect was good for someone delivering a message. Whether we got it or not is not the issue. But there was something happened in that moment that there was an ease of expression. But it wasn't necessarily a good day for the people at work in the trade tower that day, the city of New York or the United States. Are you with me how this, we got to be careful with this good, bad stuff? I'll give you one other example. Um, last month, and I talked about this in last month's video quite a bit. Last month, there was an exact trine between slow-moving Jupiter and slower-moving Neptune. Jupiter made that trine back in December. Um, then Jupiter turned retrograde, and it makes, made it again in May. It will pull all the way back and it'll make it a third and final time. I don't have the date in front of me, but I think it's in September when it makes it a third. I may be off a bit there, but, but it makes it again. Tying these three dates into a larger scenario. So we're in the midst of this period of time where although it doesn't show up exact, 
we're talking within one degree of the sky, we still have Jupiter harmonizing or trining with Neptune. This is really sweet. Why? Because Jupiter is expansive, it's optimistic, it's auspicious, it's beneficial. Jupiter's called the cosmic good guy. Okay, it's called the greater benefic, but I translate that into my English as the cosmic good guy. Again, we have to be careful of good and bad because too much of a good thing will kill you. Some of my favorite good things too much will kill you, matter of fact. All right, so Jupiter, the expansive, magnifying, opportunistic, beneficent planet, beneficial planet, is harmonizing with Neptune, which is kind of like Jupiter on steroids. Neptune is expansive, but it's not restrained by reality. Jupiter is restrained by reality. For those of you who know astrology, you know that Jupiter is inside the orbit of Saturn. So Jupiter is expansive, but it always has to answer to the big guy, to reality, to karma, to, to the rules of the universe. Jupiter is about philosophy because philosophy has to be logical. It has to have meaning. Neptune is like Jupiter that's escaped Saturn's control. Neptune is dreams, imagination, illusions. Um, Neptune is, doesn't have to answer um, to logic or rationality. Neptune is, is the ideas that are taken throughout infinite space and time. It's the, the, the infinite possibilities. So we have Jupiter trining Neptune. This is kind of cool because this says that which is growing bigger and expanding and big ideas and big thoughts and just general overall magnification, amplification hits Neptune and it says it can go anywhere. Well, the Christmas Day full moon tsunami in Indonesia that killed a quarter of a million people. Does anybody remember the year that was? 2004, was it? So, something like, maybe later. Anyhow, that tsunami occurred while Jupiter was trining Neptune. So what's that about? Well, perhaps if that didn't occur and release the tension that was building in the Earth, in, in the crust of the Earth, that created the, the earthquakes, that created the tsunami, if that didn't occur, perhaps that restraining energy would have waited another three years, five years, 50 years, and maybe blown so big that it took off half the planet. It was a release of energy. Now again, it was not a good day for the quarter of a million people who uh, lost their lives. It was not a good day for, for uh, us who, ha for, the, for those of us who have compassion with so many people, you know, having their lives abruptly ended. But, five minutes into this, I, or 10 minutes, I always do this because it's like, is that really recording? <laughs> I've shared this before, but my greatest nightmare is getting home and realizing nothing recorded, and then I have to sit in my living room alone for an hour and a half and try to do this again. It's, it's doing fine. That happened once. So here's, here's the news. Good and bad are how we work with it and how we judge it, but trines aren't always good and, um, and squares aren't always bad. Squares and oppositions aren't always good. Trines and sextiles aren't always bad. Now on June 1st, we have the, the lingering Jupiter retrograde in Scorpio. Remember, Jupiter moved into Scorpio and we had the intensification of the Trump investigations. We had the explosion of the Me Too movement in response to what began coming out. And I remember in those days, um, a friend of mine, uh, everyone, astrologers were talking about how Jupiter moving into Scorpio was uh, the, the bringing out 
out of all of this hidden um, uh, sexual power bias that we all knew about, but wasn't on the surface, that that was a perfect symbolism of Jupiter, the planet of aware, uh, the planet of growing awareness, of, of um, expansion. Um, in Scorpio, the depths, that which was hidden. And this person told me then, um, remember, Jupiter is not about an event. It's about a process. It's about a journey. Well, we're only halfway through this Jupiter's journey, maybe two thirds of the way through now, a little bit be over halfway through this journey of Jupiter moving through Scorpio, bringing into awareness all this stuff that was lower chakra stuff hidden out of sight, even though we were aware of it. So as Jupiter retrograde trines Neptune over these weeks, and it was exact or very close actually on the day that Bill Cosby was convicted, even though that wasn't the event, the event was a process of years of, of, of abuse. But Jupiter trining Neptune is still in play. And that's a slow moving aspect that will hold all the way through this fall. Into that, the faster moving planets kind of run through it. And what's happening now, and I say now, I mean the end of May and through the beginning of June, is that Venus, which moves rather fast, is actually moving through that point, which becomes the third point on the equilateral triangle. In fact, we can see Jupiter, Neptune, and Venus making this equilateral triangle, which in astrology is called a grand trine. A grand trine in traditional astrology was considered to be a blessing because you had three planets in, in whatever the element was that were all working together. I view grand trines as closed circuit TVs. In other words, depending on the element, because trines always occur in one element or the other, fire, earth, air, or water. And the fire, earth, air, water can um, correspond to the Jung psychology of four types, or in the Myers-Briggs, it's the thinking, feeling, sensing, intuiting. And water, and also the four suits in, in the tarot deck. Water, or cups in tarot, is about feeling. It's about emotion. So we have a grand water trine that in a way is like a closed circuit emotional TV program. It's almost like, like, like grand trines, uh, the, the problem with grand trines from a modern developmental psychologically, psych, psych, developmental psychological, developmental psychology standpoint. I can't do it. Anyhow. The problem with a grand trine from the standpoint of developmental psychology, did it, is that there's no way in and there's no way out. It's self-contained. It, it, it's uh, People here know Brene Brown, the psychologist who's written a whole lot about resiliency and vulnerability. Well, it's hard to be vulnerable with a grand trine in any element because it doesn't matter how crappy your life is or whether you just got fired from the jo a job or whether you just lost a dear one um, or, or whatever it is, you can go home and into the quiet of your own room, you can turn on your closed circuit TV and say, I'm emotionally okay. Grand water trine is like emotional closed circuit TV. A grand air trine is like an intellectual circuit. If you know someone who has um, a grand trine in air, it's like these are thinkers who you can't get into their logic. Their logic is so tight that no one's gonna convince them of something different. A fire grand trine is someone who has that self-sufficiency in action. Doesn't matter what's going on, that grand trine fire will be able to swing into action. They have the patterns that they run and they'll be okay because they'll do what they do. 
uh, an earth grand trine um, basically does the same thing, but in practical, it's practi it's a practical self-sufficiency. But grand trines are all self-sufficient one way or another. Okay, so we have a grand water trine here that is kind of a faster moving planet holding for a few days, maybe May 30th, um, May 31st, June 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and then that energy will begin to wane. But over the month ahead, both Mercury, which is moving faster than the Sun, Mercury will come through that same point, and then the Sun will come through that same point. And so we'll actually get this energy um, from this Jupiter Neptune trine three times once from from the fast faster moving or ahead of the pack uh, faster moving Venus then Mercury which will catch up with the Sun and move faster than it and then the Sun itself so what I'm talking about here is going to be reoccurring but it's occurring right now <laughs> except its recurrence right now is the ante is upped because of this let me change colors here because of this and that is on June 1st um, today I think I think the moon right now is still in Sagittarius I know it's in Sagittarius but by June 1st the moon will move into Capricorn and as it does it will then go through the middle degrees of Capricorn and it will be opposed to Venus and it will actually form a half of a trine, a sextile to both Jupiter and Neptune so that we end up with this pattern that we astrologers call a kite. Can you see that kite? Yeah. All right. So now let's go back to the chart itself. So what we have here is a kite. A kite is a special form of a grand trine. It's a grand trine with one of the three points on the trine having a planet that it's opposed to. Now here, Pluto is holding that position on this grand trine, but it's not exact. It's off a few degrees. But when the moon on June 1st comes whizzing through that point, it will really magnify this energy. And I imagine that we will see some expression. It's almost like that headache that we didn't have time to have all of a sudden we'll have. And again, I'm, I'm, I want to be clear here. I don't mean an individual headache. I see this as happening on a global social political realm. I think that stuff will express here too easily, whether it's the Jupiter secrets will come out um, or Neptune. We'll see where the lies or the number Neptune is not just imagination and, um, and and fantasy. It's also deceit because the two of those, the three of those are are somewhat the same. Um, but this is where this month starts off and then we even have something cooler or not cooler but also interesting on this and that is that um, we have Mercury moving rather quickly now Mercury moving through early Gemini and Mercury moves through Gemini um, until June 28th when it reaches Leo um, Mercury is still recovering. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I jumped the gun. Um, Mercury um, is, is moving quickly now, and it reaches Cancer on um, June 12th, and by the end of the month, it's in Leo. Mercury is, when it's closest to the sun, from, you know, from a, an astrological point of view, it's like the pendulum in the middle of its swing. It's moving fastest. It slows down at either ends at the retrograde direct turns. But Mercury is moving qu quickly now, which means it's moving almost to degrees a day it's only in a sign for a couple of weeks and so what will happen this month is over the next few days and we'll talk about these dates here in a moment mercury will line up with the sun and then move into cancer it will um, then move through cancer and then into leo by the end of the month meanwhile we have mars which moved into aquarius on may 15th Normally, Mars spends about six weeks in each sign. However, 
Mars, when it turns retrograde, it's the weirdest of all the retrogrades because when it turns retrograde, um, it can stay in the same sign for several months. Um, it takes Mars um, a, little a little less than two years to go around once, whizzing through each sign in about a month and a half, and then it hits one sign and it can stay there for, for months and months and months. And what, that, and what happens here is that Mars has moved into Aquarius and it will turn retrograde the end of this month um, in Aquarius uh, at about nine degrees of Aquarius. But then in August, it will move back into Capricorn where it already was and it liked being there. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then it doesn't move back into Aquarius until September. And then it doesn't move out of Aquarius until November. So we have Mars kind of holding a position in the sky but what's interesting about June 1st chart is that Mercury, which has moved into Gemini, and Mercury likes being in Gemini. Why? It's at home. I mean, uh, Mercury has two homes, Gemini and Virgo, and in Gemini, Mercury basically gets to bounce around as fast as he wants. Um, he, she, it, because Mer Mercury is uh, hermaphroditic. Um, and Mercury bounces around as quickly as, as it wants without necessarily having to hang around for the results of its thought <laughs> or, even, or even whether or not the thoughts are valid or true. Mercury in, in, in um, Gemini just doesn't care. It just wants to connect the dots. On June 1st, however, Mercury forms a trine it's actually exact on June 1st, Mercury forms a trine with Mars. And so this trine is separate from the grand trine, but it's another indication that Mercury communication is going to be smoothly connected with Mars um, energy, physical aggression. This is a day where where one can say something that's aggressive and either get away with it or in some ways things will express. I wouldn't say that this is necessarily a day when a country could or would go to war. But just to make my example, the fact is that when Mercury is trining Mars, that aggressive assertive energy, that, 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 that energy um, in Aquarius, which is erratic anyhow, is going to be expressed easily. And you add to that this grand trine, and there's that sense of invulnerability by that who, by whom, by, by he or she whom expresses it. I'm having trouble with the English language tonight. <laughs> Anyhow, I don't want to, I don't want, I mean, I, I could spend an hour or hours talking about any one chart, but this is a, this chart as a teaching moment really brings up some intriguing issues that I think set the tone for the month ahead. And it kind of fits into what I was saying about it's a month where there's not much going on, even though this kite grand water trine with the moon and Capricorn opposite Venus, I think is, is important. And incidentally, when you have a grand trine, that means that there's one planet that's opposite one of the points on the triangle. And you could say grand triangle. It's the same thing. An opposition is, is a relationship dance. It's an inner to an outer. It's, it, it's about awareness. And you look at the planet that's making the kite piece. Here, that would be the moon, and it would be moon and, and Pluto, because that moon's coming into a conjunction with Pluto um, um, later the, in the evening on June 1st. And so it's Capricorn, which is the sign of reality, of structure, of government, of banks, and that in some way becomes part of what this expressive energy is. All right, let's move ahead. Let's actually take this a day at a time, and I want you to watch, what I want you to watch here is down here, this relationship between Mercury and the Sun. From Earth's point of view, the sun moves about a degree a little bit less, but about a degree a day. 
If you think about it, that's, that becomes a duh. Well, of course. Why? Because the Earth goes around the sun once a year. There's 365 days in a year. That's, there's 360 degrees in a circle. So basically, from the Earth's point of view, the sun is moving about or a little less than one degree every day. Meanwhile, as I said earlier, um, um, Mercury is moving, um, is moving fast, is moving closer to two degrees a day. So if we go back here to the first and we follow Mercury by the fifth, because Mercury is moving twice as fast as the sun from Earth's point of view, that you'll see here on the fifth, Mercury actually between noon on the fifth and noon on the sixth. Can you see how Mercury catches up with the sun and is all of a sudden on the other side of the sun? Can you see how what that is there? So that between June 1st and June 5th, Mercury is catching up to the sun. But after June 5th, watch how Mercury, just watching down here, ju just watching down here at the Mercury sun, Mercury will get further and further away from the sun. Try not to pay attention to all the other noise. And you can see how that Mercury widens and widens and widens its distance from the sun. So what does that mean for June? It means at the beginning of June, and exact on June 5th that Mercury is aligned with the sun. Mercury is on the far side of the sun. How do I know that? Because Mercury comes around between the Earth and the sun, and as it's on the near side of the sun, whenever Mercury is closest to Earth, that's when it's retrograde. This Mercury is not retrograde, therefore it has to be on the far side of the sun. If it was retrograde, it has to be between the Earth and the sun. Now, on the far side of the sun, it's interesting because it's almost like the sun, which is our will, it's our consciousness. The sun is basically able to channel its energy through Mercury, through language, through intellect, and it's almost like there's an alignment of, of our will and our words. Our will, the sun, and our words, Mercury. With me? However, it's also important that for several days before and after the what's called the superior conjunction of Mercury to the sun, the inferior conjunction is when Mercury comes between the Earth and the sun, that during these times, Mercury is invisible. You can't see it. So it's almost like we don't have an awareness of the words we're speaking. We're speaking them because they are who we are. Because when Mercury gets close to the sun, the central filament of our consciousness, our awareness, is lined up with the planet that has to do with communication. So if you're aware of this process, that would say between now, the beginning of June, and let's say the 5th or 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th of June, that this would be a time to go out of your way to communicate those things that are important to you because they will, they, they will be an alignment. You'll be able to directly impact others with your thoughts because they will be expressing what it is that's in your, in your being, in your heart in your awareness. All right. As we move on, now the Sun and Mercury are moving rather closely together, and although Mercury passes the Sun and begins to gain distance, what happens next is interesting. We were talking about the squares earlier, and by um, June 6th and 8th, by June, no, 6th, on June 6th, while Mercury and the Sun are very close together, they both square Neptune. Mercury and the Sun, both square Neptune. And it just so happens that on the 6th, the moon is right there lined up with Neptune, empowering that square even more. Well, what is that square? Remember, squares are conflict. They're stress. 
they're, 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 they're disruptive and anxious and they need resolution. Well, what's the resolution here? This is the resolution between our logic and our thinking and our monkey mind that's connecting all the dots and can't stop thinking. But it's that square to Neptune and Pisces, which is the dream world. In the dream world, you don't need words. I mean, there can be words. But here, the problem is the dealing with the difference between what I'm saying in the intellect and the thoughts and the actual um, uh, larger um, illusion, fantasy, dream that those thoughts are part of. So what does this mean? It means that we need to be extra careful about what we say. Why? Because we can think that we're saying something absolutely clearly and the person we're talking to might be like in that Gary Larson cartoon where the dog is hearing blah, 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 food, blah, 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 blah. Most of what, we'll, what we're saying, we might think that we're being very, very clear and the person listening to us with great attention might be hearing blah, 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 blah. So we really need to go out of our way during this period of time um, to be as concise as we can. And also the flip side of that, because communication is a two-way street, it means we also have to go out of our way to listen to make sure we don't hear what we're believing rather than what is being said, which means active listening and, and maybe even um, actually um, uh, asking questions of what the person actually said. Are you with me? All right. That would be, that would be on June 6th. Now, because those two planets are still traveling fairly close together by, <clears throat> oh, we're going to skip that one. We're going to jump to June 12th. Now, watch how fast Mercury is moving. And by June 12th, Mercury moves from Gemini into Cancer. And now Mercury is ahead of the sun. It's like our intellect is the scout. It's the forward thinking part of us that the sun hasn't quite caught up with. Is that feedback killing anybody? No one looks dead. A few people look asleep. No. All right. So Mercury ahead of the sun, Mercury moves into the sign of Cancer um, on June 12th. The sun, which is moving half as fast, takes another week. And I'm going to just blip, go this forward. Watch, watch, the, 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 watch the sun here. Let's see, where can I do this here? I suppose I could just point to it. <laughs> Anal analog, not digital. Um, watch the sun here. The sun will, over the following week, move onward, 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 onward. And then by June 21st, the sun actually moves into, it's late on the, uh, on the 21st, the sun moves from Gemini into Cancer. Now, the reason why this is important is that the four anchor points of the astrological um, compass are the first moments of the seasons, are the summer and winter solstice and the, uh, the spring and autumn equinox. I'm not going to go too deeply into this right now, um, but these points and the points halfway in between them called the, the course co cross quarter holidays, um, which on our modern calendar, you know, are May Day, um, May Day opposite Halloween, um, uh, Yule Tide um, um, opposite. Um, I don't know what the American holiday is. I guess there is none on the August second. But these are these are anchor dates. But the sun's movement into Cancer is particularly significant because it starts the new season of the summer. And in fact, the cardinal signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn, cardinal signs, are all hinges into a new experience, into a new season. Aries is the initiation into spring. Cancer is the initiation into summer in the northern hemisphere. And of course, if you live below the equator, that would be winter. They're reversed. 
Um, and then um, Libra is the initiation or entrance into um, autumn in the Northern Hemisphere and Capricorn would be winter. So this piece here is very important, but there's something else that's cooking, which is very interesting. And I'm going to hear just for a moment, get rid of all the extra lines to the moon. I should have done this earlier because they're just a bit noisy. Um, get rid of that. All right. Um, whoop. Come on. There we go. So we have the sun getting ready to change signs, but remember that grand trine that was active on June 1st? By June 15th, we have um, Mercury forming. It actually is exact on June 19th, 20th. So how can that be? Oh, yeah, here we are. Sure. By, by June 18th, 19th, 20th, that Mercury is moving through the same point in mid-Cancer where Venus was on June 1st. So we're getting a replay of that grand water trine, but this time we're getting it without the moon there. There's no kite. But again, we have this feel good internalization of emotions. There's this sense of self-sufficiency. Um, and again, there's expression, whether it's individual internal to ourselves or country. Remember, the country acts astrologically like, it, like an individual. And, and in fact, the United States is on July 4th. It's a cancer. It's about home. It's about isolationism. Okay, so we have taken over half the world. Well, we could say Earth is home and we just want to make it all ours for our own safety. But the fact of the matter here is that on June 20th and 21st, that Mercury is activating that, um, that uh, grand trine again. And into that comes the sun. And I think here, um, the other thing that is, that is significant, and I want to go back as we pass this over. I need, I need to back, back, back. Okay. So as we come toward the middle of June, we, I, I totally skipped over, and I want to spend a moment uh, talking about the new moon on June 13th at, um, it's early in the day. Oh, no. The new moon is at 12.43 p.m., 12.43 p.m. Well, here we're at noon. We're close enough. So I want to just pause this here for a second. And now remember that new moons are in, they're the beginning of the next cycle. Lunar cycles are, are emotional cycles. And we have this new moon in Gemini. And they are the only two planets in Gemini. And matter of fact, what's interesting about this new moon is like everything else that I've t talked about about the month of, of June, is that there's not a lot happening. The, the new moon itself, that degree, is not incredibly active. There is, there is a couple degree quincunx, this green line that I just drew the squiggly black line over. Um, the sun and the moon, the new moon is quincunx Pluto. Quincunxes are annoying. They require adjustment. What's the adjustment here? Gemini is high frequency arguably shallow. Uh, it's fun because it can connect everything. It's the cocktail party chitter chatter. It's the ability to engage here and engage there and to say that's interesting and then play a game of chess and then read a book. And it's, it can be distractive or scattered even. But it also is really good at connecting dots. You know, um, Geminis are, are people that can bring images from many things together in a very effective way. Bob Dylan is a classic Gemini. Um, so is Paul McCartney. And they, now Dylan isn't necessarily as light, I say lightweight, I mean light, lightweight emotionally as Paul McCartney, but Dylan's imagery in a lot of his early stuff pulls from everywhere. And anyone who knows anything about Dylan and his um, rise to fame and through his first 10 or 15 years um, as a singer-songwriter, he would give two interviews the same day with different publications, and he would tell entirely different stories about the same thing. It, it can be said that Geminis are liars. Um, Trump. Um, 
But the fact of the matter is that Geminis can talk out of both sides of the mouth at the same time. It's the twins. It's that dual recognition of nature. Um, I was telling someone at the astrology conference last week that I've been kind of collecting and or writing aphorisms for all of the signs and planets. And Gemini is, the, is one of my favorite, but it's the only one that I stole, <laughs> which is fitting for Gemini. And, and, and the aphorism or the line is, how can you be two places at once when you're nowhere at all? And it comes from an old Fire Sign Theater album. So here we have this Gemini moon that is not connected pretty much to anything except to Pluto. And Pluto in Capricorn, Pluto is heavyweight. Pluto is Darth Vader, Darth Pluto. It's the Lord of the underworld. It's, it's, it's death and regeneration. It's transmutation. Pluto, um, I have an astrologer friend who calls Pluto Roto-Rooter. You know, when Pluto comes in, it cleans out everything. <laughs> it doesn't matter what's there. So the quincunx, the five twelfths aspect between this lightweight Gemini, um, tap dancing, whimsical, breezy, changeable, clever, witty, and even fun Gemini, wordy Gemini, Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman wrote, I contain multitudes. Walt Whitman was a Gemini. So this new moon in Gemini is having a mathematical connection, a quincunx, and, and a hard time, but not conflict, just annoyance with Pluto that says, stay still, go deep, get serious, and take apart the entire structure, Capricorn, of everything so we can rebuild it the way that we need to. You see the dilemma here? The other thing about this um, new moon, we still have operative the Jupiter trine Neptune because that's just with us. And again, I'm not going to dig uh, you know, deeper into that symbolism. Last month, I, we took a deep dive into it. But that's, that's there all the time throughout this year or at least through this month again. The other thing, though, that is significant during this month, uh, I'm sorry, during this new moon is that... Venus changes signs and moves into Leo um, just, um, uh, just hours after the new moon. Literally hours after the new moon. Oh, we're talking about the same day, you know, square um, June 13th. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's right there on the edge. And, um, and oh no, that's Mercury. Mercury, Venus. No, Venus moves into Leo. So here we have Venus right there at 29 degrees and 51 minutes in the last degree. And if we were to move that ahead just a few hours, that Venus would move on into Leo. And once that Venus was in Leo, it would be making a 90 degree angle. It already is pretty much um, with Uranus having just moved into Taurus. I say just remember Uranus moved into Taurus mid-May, but it moves so slowly it'll stay in Taurus for seven years. And so it's just moved into Taurus for a month or two or three or four. All right, Venus square Uranus was the example that I used earlier about good news, bad news. All right, the, the bad news about Venus squaring Uranus is that it's hard, it's hard to build something stable when Venus is square Uranus. Why? Uranus is about, is about topsy-turvy. It's about ingenious expression. It's futuristic. It's electric. It's sudden. Uranus releases tension wherever it is. But it's also exciting. It's brilliant. It's innovative. It's, in, it's ingenious. Venus is the planet of love. When Venus is square Uranus, we can fall in love instantaneously, hard and fast. Venus square Uranus is the love of what? It's the love of weird shit. <laughs> It's the love of things that are different. It's the love of some idea that is new and innovative and different and disruptive to everything that you ever knew. It's the falling in love with someone that is impossible for you. Um, someone of, um, of a different ilk from anyone else that you've ever fallen in love with. Um, whether that means a different race, a different gender, the same gender, a different nationality, a different socioeconomic class, um, a different color hair, a different body type. I, it doesn't matter. Uranus is different. 
And Venus square Uranus says, I love this difference. It's, it can be a cool and amazing and electric and head spinning. The problem is that it's difficult to maintain that energy. Doesn't mean it's impossible. I actually um, had a client the other day um, with a Venus Uranus relationship, and it, and it was going great. I mean, this person was, you know, for the first time in a few years, like totally head over heels for someone, and they had a relationship in their individual birth charts of Venus to Uranus. And what I told this person was that this relationship um, can remain magical if you can keep it new. If you can keep a sense of unknown, a sense of excitement, a sense of edginess, a sense of quirkiness, a sense of kinkiness, a sense of other than normal, then you guys can be golden. But as soon as it settles into a routine, it'll be the end of it. Now, other relationships that are Saturnine don't like that crazy crap. And in fact, there are healthy relationships that don't work unless there's a routine for it to settle into. See the difference here? With Uranus, I'm sorry, with Venus square Uranus though, this new moon has that kind of edginess, that uncertainty, and our reactions may be very different. Someone might really, really like it because it keeps them on edge and it's so exciting, and someone else might be freaking out and saying, I want stability, I do not want this anymore. That's the new moon in Gemini. Intentions around a new moon, whether you do it at the moment of the new moon, I don't believe it's so important. I think the universe is plastic, it's bendable, um, it's adaptable. There are no cycles in nature that are exact. I have cosmic, magical, um, witchy friends who say that's a crock of shit. When you do a ritual, you do it at exact that moment. I'm not selling one idea or the other. If though I had to pick a moment of doing it before or after, I would do it after because it catches the energy. Rather, the new moon itself is like a race razor edge. Is, is there something different? It's like a cusp that has no forgiveness one side or another. If you were, if, if someone's chart, uh, if, you, if you do a chart for someone born five minutes before a new moon, that's very different than a chart five minutes after a new moon. Why? Because the person born five minutes before the new moon is ending an old cycle. The person born five minutes after the new moon is beginning a new cycle. So, ritual. Um, uh, my dear friend Caroline Casey says the planets don't speak English. You can't just write down your intentions. The planets don't care. She adds because she's a practitioner of some um, magical South American things. She says the planets don't even speak Spanish. Um, they speak. They speak ritual. They speak movement. They speak action. If you want something to happen, if you have intentions, which is a great time for a, at a new moon to plant the seeds of intention. If you want to plant the seeds of intention at a Gemini moon, the intentions that you want to plant are intellectual. They are thoughts. They are about connecting. They are about learning. They are about communicating. But you can't do it by talking about it. You have to do it by doing it. You can't prime a pump with water by thinking, I'm going to get a cup of water and I'm going to imagine pouring it into the pump and then I'm going to pump and the water is going to come out. You have to go over and get the damn water and do it. And so coming up with rituals and coming up with some way to let the planets know that you're intending over the next couple of weeks as the moon grows from new to full to bring this element of whatever it is into your life. This is the way to do it. Ritual is very important. It's the way that we bring the planets incarnate into our, into our bodies, into our lives. All right. Don't want to hang out there longer than we... 
Ken, we have a couple other things to cover, We're, and then we'll, okay. So, that's the, that's the new moon. Um, uh, as I mentioned, what happens right after the new moon um, is um, first Mercury has moved into Cancer, and then Venus moves into Leo. These are two big changes, and, and it's interesting because it's almost like passing the torch. It's almost like Cancer isn't big enough to have Venus at Mercury this time around. Venus in Cancer is sweet. It doesn't matter w how you love or where Venus is in your chart, whether you're a Sagittarian and every act of love you do is the biggest thing in the universe, or whether your love is in Scor whether your Venus is in Scorpio and, and you love in a way that's very passionate and intense, but not necessarily with words, or whether your Venus by birth is in Gemini and you talk you talk a good sex act, you know, whether the you know, Venus, um, Venus and Mercury talks about it. Um, Venus and Aries is, um, is the love of something new and so on. When Venus moves, it, when Venus is moving through cancer, which it is through the first part of June, that which we love is sweet is soft, is nurturing, is tender. The danger is that we can over nurture or be over nurtured, which means we might have that, we might have to deal with the Klingons. <laughs> you know what the Klingons are? I love you. Don't move. <laughs> you can't move. It's um, Venus in Cancer can be over. Let's let's say this in a, in a nice way. It can be overly protective. It cares, but it can be overly caring. Um, that doesn't mean that it is, but there's that sense of Venus in Cancer of being unspoken and soft and sweet and gentle, even nurturing. When Venus moves into Leo, it reminds me of this old commercial, which seems so outdated now because it was amazing when the FTD, the floral transmission delivery something or other, came around and you could live in El Paso, Texas and wire flowers to someone who lived in Langdon, North Dakota by just calling this number and everything would be taken care of and the flowers would be delivered that day. This was a miracle 50 years years ago. You know, now with the internet, you know, that, this kind of stuff seems, seems archaic. But this, there was a particular TV commercial that advertised this service. And for whatever reason, although I've never used the service, the commercial has stayed in my head. And it was an animated person of, of going, of, of as they talked, animated flowers would come out of their mouth and the commercial was say it with flowers <laughs> Venus and Leo <laughs> Venus and Leo is say it with flowers it's it's express your love through some sort of act it's not I love you it's look at this I you you know it's dramatic it's it's it's, it's animated um, it's it, it's maybe overly animated even but boy that Venus and Leo when it loves it loves magnificently and so Venus being in Leo um, through the end of June and on through um, most of July um, becomes a piece of the puzzle that moves us into feeling more like some midsummer because Leo is midsummer cancer is the beginning of summer and incidentally, that move of the sun into Cancer on the solstice on the 21st, you know, the summer sun doesn't get most intense. No season is most intense until the middle part of that season, the fixed sign. In other words, spring becomes most spring-like when the sun is in Taurus. Summer becomes most summer-like when, summer when the sun is in Leo. Autumn becomes most autumnal when the sun is in Scorpio. I uh, think of the Halloween and the leaves falling, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's the act. Um, the winter becomes most winter-like when the sun is in fixed sign Aquarius. It's all in the Northern Hemisphere, of course. Um, so what we have is Venus moving into Leo, uh, Venus moving into Leo, and 
Mercury moving from Gemini into Cancer ahead of the Sun. Now, interestingly enough, Mercury in Cancer is tricky because Mercury we think of as expressive, but Cancer is receptive. And Mercury in Cancer actually can be a better listener than talker. Mercury in Cancer can be verbose, but Cancer, just like when the Sun moves into Cancer, any planet in Cancer, it has to feel secure. If, if one is feeling emotionally insecure, I'm going to move this ahead to put the Sun on into Cancer also. If one is feeling emotionally insecure and one has crab energy, crab energy, whether it's the sun or the moon in Cancer, Cancer Ascendant, Mercury, Venus, Mars in Cancer, um, or a mother. Uh, no, I mean, Cancer is the sign of mothering. It's, it's nurturing. And the crab lives in the intertidal zone, that place on the planet where the ocean meets the shore, where the tides come up and down and up and down every day. The tides are always changing. The moon, which is the planet related to Cancer, is always changing. Our moods, the moon, the moods are always changing. Feelings are always changing. They're water, they're flowing. Crabs live in the intertidal zone because it's the most nutrient-rich place on the planet. Every time the tide comes up, it gets refreshed with new um, plants and animals and things to eat, and nutrients, and the crab does very well there, but the crab always has to be paying attention to the changing tides. The tides are always changing because if it's left high and dry, it could die. And if it doesn't get close enough up to the edge, then it may miss its nutrients. So crabs have these like advanced sensory antenna that are not about the five senses that can somehow tell when the tides are going to change before they change. And any of you who are Cancerians or no Cancerian people know that Cancers are the ones that have fear or sensitivity around something that's going to change way before it changes. They just know. And so the crab is terribly insecure. Why? Because it should be. Because if it's not paying attention, it'll get washed out to sea. What does it do? Well, first of all, because it has no backbone, it lives in an exoskeleton. It has a hard outer shell. And because it's afraid that shell won't protect it enough, it finds a harder, larger outer shell of some crustacean who's no longer inhabiting his shell and crawls into that. So you have the crab inside the larger shell now walking around that if you get near and touch, it's gone. You can't even find that crab. It, it pulls into its it pulls into its shell inside of the larger shell. But often that's not even enough, and that crab will drag that larger outer shell and wedge it under a rock or crawl into a little cave so that it is protected from these larger changes. We as humans, our shells are our homes and our family, because those are the things that don't change. They're the, they're the exoskeleton that protect us from the changing tides out there. Are you with me here? So we have the sun moving into Cancer on the 21st. We have Mercury having moved into, um, Mer Mercury having moved into Cancer, um, I know I said this, on the 12th, and it's like, we can be very hesitant about expressing ourselves. With, this, with Mercury and Cancer, we can be very hesitant to say something. But if we feel at home, if we feel safe, if we feel nurtured, we can get as crazy or crazier than anyone. And anyone who's been with a Cancer who feels safe on a full moon knows that they have the biggest belly laugh and the, it can be more fun than anyone. But as soon as they feel unsafe, it's gone. They're behind that shell. Okay, let's move on. Got a couple other things to talk about and a full moon. And so 
We're on the 20th, 21st, um, the beginning of summer, the sun moving into Cancer. Um, incidentally, on the 21st, we also have Venus um, in Ve Venus in Leo. We have Venus in Leo opposite Mars in Aquarius. Venus and Leo are the cosmic lovers. Venus is what we like, what we desire. Mars is how we get it. Venus is our, uh, our wants and Mars is our physicality. Venus is sensual of the senses and Mars is physical. It's the, it's the engagement. And Venus and Mars in opposition is not bad, but traditionally they would be called afflicted, but it just means that there's energy to be worked out. In love, that can be lovely. <laughs> It can also be arguments and not so lovely. It depends on how you work with it. But there definitely here is some tension between the him and the her of each of us. Whether it's totally contained or whether it's through relationship, there's some need for dialogue here. Um, and remember that dialogue now is a little bit easier because as I said earlier, that Mercury is moving through that grand trine point creating that watery grand trine. All right, we move on and the next thing I want to talk about is that Mercury um, becomes on the on the 23rd, Mercury is exactly opposite Pluto. Mercury opposite Pluto. Let me do this here. Um, Mercury opposite Pluto. Um, this is stressful in communication, but it's engagement. Mercury, remember, was sent by Jupiter into the underworld to rescue Ceres' daughter, Persephone. And Mercury is the communicator. Mercury goes back and forth. When Mercury is opposite Pluto, Mercury is one of the planets that actually can stand up to Pluto. Not because it has something to stand for, but because it can take Pluto's message and bring it up into the real world. So this becomes a point that is operative around the solstice on the 21st and the next few days, where we can, in fact, go into the underworld, get that that buried the suppressed feelings, uh, the repressed um, anger or whatever it may be and bring it up into a relationship dialogue where if we talk about it, we can actually um, transform it into something that is um, useful or valuable, um, developmental even. Um, Okay, and now we come to the, well, there's two, three things we need to talk about, all of them, which will be really easy, two of them will be really quick. Um, on June 26th, Mars, which has been slowing down in Aquarius, Mars turns retrograde. Um, the, I think I threw these dates out before. Let me just say them again so that we have them here. Mars moved into Aquarius on May 15th. It turns retrograde on June 26th. It backs into Capricorn on August 12th. It turns direct in Capricorn on August 27th. It moves back into Aquarius on September 10th. And it stays in Aquarius for the rest of September, all of October, and leaves Aquarius for the watery, uh, watery realms of Pisces on November 15th. So we have this period of time that's five months long when, when Mars is either retrograde or hanging out in the shadow realms that he's already covered um, uh, previously. Um, Mars is interesting retrograde because as it gets closer to the Earth, um, it looks like from Earth's point of view that it is in opposition to the Sun, which it is. But that means that Earth and Mars are close together because Earth and Mars are on the same side of the Sun. So that that Earth is in between the Sun on one side, Mars on the other. But Earth and Mars being on the same side of the Sun make them close together, meaning that Mars gets bigger in the sky and redder. No, it does not get bigger than the moon, regardless of what you might read on the internet. Um, but the thing is, is that when Mars gets closer to the Earth, the Earth gets angrier. 
Unfortunately, when Mars is retrograde, this is often the time of flare-ups. Not that there's ever a time when there's no aggression, but there's a time when tempers can get more uh, radical, more expressive on an international political basis, but also in our individual lives. Now remember, individually, when a planet is retrograde, we often look at the too much of that energy as being too much and we shut it down, we bury it which sounds like a good thing to do if we want to hit someone we just bury it and say I'm not going to hit them but what we resist is what persists and often the denial of something creates an unexpected something that happens that then releases that energy so we're going to be talking about Mars retrograde more um, over the next months it's just important that Mars is slowing down which means that we may not be getting to where we're going to as fast as we thought we were and then there may be some time where we can feel frustrated because it's not happening in the way that we imagined it because Mars is the planet of energy and new direction is actually covering old ground rather than new ground. That was one thing, one of three things. Um, well, one other thing about that Mars, um, about that Mars um, retrograde is that Mars turns, is it Mars? Hold on a second. It's... Ah, no. Well, on, around the same time that Mars turns retrograde, remember, Mars is also, during this period of time, Mars is opposite um, Venus. Um, let me just get the date that I want to put this up. Let's put up the 25th. Well, this is close enough for what I'm going to do. All right. So, so we have Venus opposite Mars um, um, back on... On the 21st, thank you. Um, we have that Venus actually squaring Jupiter on the 25th. Mars, which had been moving forward and is close enough to be squaring Jupiter, never reaches that square. It turns retrograde. Jupiter square Mars is cool. It's enthusiasm. It's overdoing. It's 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 indulgent, and so we're feeling that. But we have to. We 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 can't consummate it. It backs off. But Venus moving through that territory opposes Mars and squares Jupiter, kind of making this this T square, this 90 degree, 90 degree, and then an opposition. And this is a bit stressful. And it does involve Jupiter, the planet of too much. And again, we may learn more than we want to know about secret dealings, which seems to be one of Jupiter's jobs as it's moving through um, secretive um, power mongering, um, abuse of power in sexuality, Scorpio. Um, we may get another wave of this toward the end of June as this aspect becomes um, predominant. All right. June 27th, we're coming into the full moon, and this full moon, unlike the new moon, let's jump to the full moon for a minute because I can explain two as I talk about three. I said I had three things, or maybe four, but let's, let's talk about this full moon. Um, let's do this an hour at a time, and let's do this. All right. That's close enough for the full moon. This full moon is a total powerhouse. Now remember, new moons are new beginnings. The full moons are the culminations of what it was that began at the new moon. So the intentions and the rituals that you did at the new moon are coming to fruition now. And this full moon, um, at a new moon or full moon, the first thing you look for are what are the aspects that are being made to the sun and the moon. And here at this full moon, we have a conjunction between Saturn and the moon, which means that the sun is opposing Saturn. Now, this, the, the sun technically um, opposes Saturn um, on the 27th. And the new moon, uh, it opposes Saturn at 6 a.m. 6, 6 a.m. on the 27th Pacific time. And the new moon is a few hours later.
9.52, almost 10 p.m. on the same day. It's pretty damn close. One would say, an astrologer would say that this full moon is conjunct Saturn. And this can be a problem. <laughs> Why? Oh, it also can be very powerfully positive. But Saturn is karma. It's you get what you deserve. The full moon is our feelings. It's how we nurture. The full moon is no boundary. It's, it's, it's mom is basically always there to protect, or at least theoretically. The moon is how we, it's our sense of belonging. Saturn is our sense of isolation. It's the dad going off to work. It's the separation in order to maintain some place in the outer world or identity. So Saturn and the moon don't blend easily, but it's a critical point and it is certainly a karmic point until you get what you deserve. This full moon is incredibly powerful because, because not only is the moon lined up with Saturn, but the, but the sun opposite Saturn says that in some way, Saturn, our ambitions, our hard work, the karma of getting what we deserve is very far away from where we are. Now, this is a full moon in Capricorn, which means the sun is in the moon's sign. Saturn is in its own sign. Saturn is related, related to the sign of Capricorn. Moon is related to the sign of Cancer. This is an incredibly powerful full moon because Saturn, the sign of Capricorn, is lined up with the moon, the sign of Cancer, and the sun is in the sign of Cancer. It, it energizes this whole thing to a, to a very high level. And it says that there will be stress and tension over doing what is real versus what we feel. How can can I nurture and, and also encourage um, a, a growth and development? The problem with nurturing, as I think I said earlier, can limit growth. But here, I think it works the other way around. I think that that, that moon over Saturn is that we can run into areas in our life with, where we've either overextended or overexpanded, or something looked good, and Saturn lined up with that full moon basically says, whoa, stop. Reconsider this, figure out what you're doing, make another plan, back up a little bit and get it right so you can get it right. On the other hand, if you've been doing the work, Saturn rewards hard work. And if you've been doing the work that you set up and intended at the new moon, then Saturn is going to guarantee you results. Usually we humans fall short of following through on those plans or those intentions that we make. All right, then on the 28th, Mercury changes signs. Mercury moves from um, Cancer into Leo. And all of a sudden, we have more of a flavor of Leo. Oh, we're still going an hour at a time. Let me change this back to a day at a time. All of a sudden, we have more energy in Leo than in Cancer. And this is almost like, even though the sun is still in Cancer and still has another couple of weeks in Cancer, it's almost like we get an early summer, whether that's weather-wise or whether it's in now just the expression of love becomes more, more easy, more dramatic. And just like when Venus moved into Leo, when, when uh, Mercury moves into Leo, the first thing that happens is that, that Mercury is confronted by a square to Uranus. And again, Mercury is communication. Uranus is unexpected. It's like we say things that we don't mean to. We learn things that we didn't want to know. Or we are excited about something new, but it throws us off course. This is, it's, it's, it's exciting, but destabilizing. And I think this is an important piece of that Mercury moving into Leo. And in fact, we will get that a, a third time in July when the sun, um, moves toward the 20th of July, when the sun moves into Leo, we'll get that square again as it squares, um, as, as it squares Uranus. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. All right, I think from a standpoint of what's going on this month, I think I've said what needed to be said. And again, I'm going to reiterate that we looked at a lot of little different things. 
And Mars turning retrograde, by the way, is not a little thing, but I don't know that we're going to feel the result. It's going to build as it goes retrograde and then reaches its opposition to the sun again. That's when we're going to feel it most intensely. But I think that the frustration of Mars feeds into everything. But again, I think that the operative thing about this month is that instead of one big thing or two or three big things or four or five medium sized things, we have 16 little things. <laughs> And I think it's a matter of moving through the month with how do we handle all the things on a day-to-day -day basis? And more importantly, what do we do when the big shit comes up that either we didn't handle individually or someone in our lives, in, in our lives didn't handle or um, nationally, um, politically, these things come up because there's not, it's, Again, it's not that there's no things new, double negative again. It's just that the processing of the other things, I think, become more important. And we'll see that even more as Mars moves through its retrograde. Um, incidentally, in July, not only will we be dealing with more aspects of that Mars retrograde, but we also have um, in July um, the first um, eclipse of the summer. I think the other one's in August, I'm pretty sure. I had those somewhere. But, um, but so we'll be back in eclipse territory in, in July. Um, what do we do? We breathe, we love, we go through our days the best we can, and we remember that it's okay to have distant goals. It's even important to have distant goals. But the only place where action occurs is in the present moment. And I think that's part of what the month of June is all about, is using the available bandwidth that we may not have had previously because we've been distracted by these huge events to use the, that bandwidth preemptively rather than waiting for something intense to go down. That's it. This is where you applaud. Why not? <laughs>